Uh, before we get into this episode, I just want to go through some very important show announcements for everybody. Um, thanks again for being a listener and being a part of this uh, this whole year. I've had a lot of fun with uh, putting out the podcast, talking with you guys, um, sharing emails and DMs and hearing all your stories. And uh, hopefully we're helping a lot of people um, get better at hunting and planning out their strategies and on their quest to uh, kill a nice buck with a bow, uh, whether you're in the suburbs or you're in the big mountains. Um, we just want to thank you guys for listening. So on that note, some huge uh, announcements. Um, we're going to be doing a, a big New Year's raffle. So you guys will all have until December 31st to enter this raffle. And we will draw five winners on January 3rd, the first episode of the new year. So we're hopefully uh, going to be ending 2020 on a high note here. So in the prize package, we'll do three Onyx Elite subscriptions. We'll do a Trophy Ridge React H5 bow sight, which is what I currently use. Um, we're going to do 10 pairs of socks from uh, actually one of my other companies, Troll Socks. Um, that's trollsocks.com, T-R-O-L-L, socks.com. Um, and I like wearing those socks during the early season. They got some uh, extra fur around the, the toes, keep you warm, but um, it's not a super heavy sock that's going to make you sweat. So we'll give away 10 pairs of those, and then finally we'll do a case of wine from none other than Heron Hill. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be drawing. It's going to be you know January 3rd, so just after Christmas, but uh, hey, sort of a Christmas raffle. Um, but hey, we're going to be looking good into 2021. So here's what you got to do to enter the raffle. You just need to buy some wine from heronhill.com using our code HS5 and then screenshot the receipt and send us proof. Um, you can either DM it on social media or email it to huntsuburbia at gmail.com. Um, I mean, wine's a no-brainer gift for the holidays, so why not enter a raffle while you're doing your shopping? Um, and here's how it's going to work. If you buy one bottle, you'll be entered once. If you buy a case, which is 12 bottles, you'll be entered 12 times. If you buy 100 bottles, you'll be entered 100 times. Um, so remember, with a volume discount and using code HS5, you're going to get a total 20% off a case, and you're going to get free shipping. Um, and if you live in Vermont uh, or one of the few states where Heron Hill doesn't deliver to, um, just go to trophyridge.com and buy anything on their site. And for every $15 you spend on trophyridge.com, you'll be entered into the raffle once. Um, and again, just share, take a screenshot, share the receipts, um, show us proof that you bought something uh, either by DMing or sending us an email. So, hey, great raffle. Um, we hope you guys all participate in it and can't wait to give away some free stuff. And then um, just real quick again, before, before we get into this awesome interview, um, the outlook for 2021. What is in store for Hunt Suburbia? So we may not have an episode every single Sunday in the off season. Um, I'm going to shoot for it. Uh, life comes at you fast. There's a lot of stuff piling up on the honeydew list here uh, that's going to have to get done. So I'm, I'm going to shoot for putting out an episode every week, but it, realistically it's probably going to be every other week. Um, we'll still shoot for Sundays. And we'll be doing some fishing episodes, some you know shed hunting episodes, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and also in 2021, we'd love to put out more videos, more content. So if you're someone who listens, loves the show, and you want to contribute to our channel, um, you know, email me, DM me, you know, tell me what you want to do. Um, I just would love to build a, a bigger team here. And obviously, I'm looking for like videographers, editors, content creators, uh, anybody that wants to be a part of the team, um, and would like to help grow our YouTube channel, maybe the podcast network a little bit, um, just shoot me an email. And then finally, merch. So a lot of people are asking about merch, when are we going to have some merch up? Um, I know it's a great way to support the show, so we'll be working on some merch for 2021. Um, for now, to support the show, just spread the word, use our code HS5 on heronhill.com, interact with our sponsors, and let them know that we're building something special over here at Hunt Suburbia. And again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys all for listening. You're listening to the Hunt Suburbia podcast. I'm your host, Pat Guyette. Big bucks I've been dreaming often, every night till I'm in a coffin. From Mount Woods to the burbs of Boston, I'm looking for a tree to get lost in. Chris Warner's little dust in the snow, quality time, just me and my bow. 
fall evenings I know just where to go for some quality time for me and my bow. It's just me and my bow. This episode is brought to you by Heron Hill Winery. Go to heronhill.com, make sure that they deliver to your state, and use code HS5 at checkout for an additional 5%. This week I interviewed Chad Whitcomb. He is a local hunter here. He's a great hunter. He is really interested in deer behavior and studying deer, so he runs a lot of cameras. He runs them almost year-round. He likes to see what they're doing on scrapes, not only during the season, but in the off-season. A lot of you guys might not know, but in the off season, deer visit scrapes uh, often, maybe not as often as the rut, but they're hitting those scrapes and um, using it as a communication tool all year round. And he likes to uh, learn what he can from that. Um, he, we dive into deer glands and what the glands mean for communicating um, within the deer herd. And we talk about um, how he makes mock scrapes and some tips for making a great mock scrape and not leaving your scent there, but leaving only the scent of uh, deer glands. And uh, he's extracted some scents from local deer, turned it into a little business, BackyardScents.com. But this episode is really heavy into deer scents, um, strategy around mock scrapes and how to make a killer mock scrape for your season, uh, including late season mock scrapes because we're in a late season right now. So hope you guys enjoy it. Anyways, um, so I'm sitting in the stand and I saw a, a doe and a couple of skips come behind me. And that whole time I was hunting, yeah, um, I was seeing does with no bucks falling behind them. And I'm like, why am I the only guy in the woods that you're in like the peak of the rut and I have these single mature does coming through, yeah. walking into my stand, nothing behind them. And uh, I said, well, maybe they're already bred. Who, who knows? And they're trying to get away. But then some does are coming in there panting. What I'm were like, the dates that you were there? The seventh, eighth, not all the way to the fourteenth, thirteenth wow, yeah, left. Yeah. So right like yep. right there. And um so the day I was sitting was the twelfth, mm-hmm. November. So I see a doe come through with a skip behind two skips behind me, no buck following them. That's so that's like legit like eight does that have walked around me, mature, good sized does that um <laughs> had nothing following. Sounds like Vermont. Oh seriously, <laughs> dude. So um so then I'm sitting in, I, I remember sitting down on my stand and I'm like, man, I said, how many more does can I see without no bucks chasing? And on the 10th, I actually got um, on my trail camera, a doe coming through an opening in a fence of a property to the property we can hunt with, uh, that was 3.15 in the morning, where the big wide eight point falling behind her and then the, a 10 pointer falling behind that. And that mm-hmm. was the biggest rack buck that we had on camera. That was the only video. And um, I had a buddy shoot at that deer and uh, just we didn't know at the time it was that deer, and uh, kind of like nicked the back. Um, we still didn't know what a shot was. And then on the twelfth, I'm sitting there saying to myself, "I'm like, man, what's going on?" I was in a real thick area with a it was a pinch point, like a real, real nice pinch point, and this little bit of a ravine, a little drop. And to my right side and below me was all the Russian olive, mm-hmm. so you can't even see. Mm-hmm. I couldn't even see eight yards in front of me to the right. And, and that's, that, that's their bedding source, you think? So it was a peninsula that stuck out into the cut corn. Yeah. And so what it was, was it was just like a travel corridor. They come from each property. It's just these small little windrows yep. of land yep. that they drive coming down. And it could have been. It could have been part of their bedding area to get away. And, you know, it was only, if I probably say it was maybe maybe an acre right there, what I was sitting on. And then it was all open cut corn mm-hmm. and uh, miles of it. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and the squirrels out there, they like these fox squirrels. They're like five pounds. They're huge. <laughs> they make the biggest noise. It's not like 200-pound deer constantly. And there's a lot of them. I see why their sheds get torn up. And then you have the gray squirrels. So the squirrels are jumping around, and I'm sitting there, and I heard, like, I heard a leaf in front of me, kind of like, you can hear it, like, I heard the crunch. And then I'm listening, and then I'm like, then I heard a, a stick snap. And I'm like, you can almost hear it getting pushed into the ground. I said, that's not a squirrel. Yeah. So I grabbed my bow. And um, as soon as I got my bow down in front of me, this doe comes running out. I mean, she just appeared 15 yards in front of me out of that Russian olive. And uh, it's amazing when she's being chased that she still sees you. Because I was in a, uh, a, um, a shagbuck hickory tree that had full leaves on it. Like, not one leaf off this tree. And she looked right up at me and she stopped. But when she stopped was key. Because when she stopped, she had like a yearling behind her that split back to my right, and then she went to my left. Mm-hmm. 
and I thought she was going to turn left and go down and run to when my uh, my shooting lane was in front of my camera, but she went straight up the hill. And then all of a sudden, I hear Grunton. And then all the noise started happening. Grunton, this wide eight point came down, stopped in the same exact location she did. And I had this little pie plate hole to shoot through. And uh, I drew back, and I uh, about to come down. And the buck, he took off. He figured out, he stopped because he figured out which way the doe went because he thought the yearling, he didn't know what was going on. He just yeah. figured it out, caught her wind, and went that way. As I'm watching the deer go up the hill, I'm like, oh, that was my opportunity because mm-hmm. this is, we got one more day than a, than a morning hunt, and that's it. And then I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I hear the noise on my right again. I said, oh, it must be the yearling coming through, catching up to the doe. And all I see is horns coming through. And like it is happened. that 10 point? It was a 10 point. I see the horns coming through, and I didn't put two and two together who he was yet. Mm-hmm. And he came right in, same exact spot, and stopped exactly where the doe stopped yeah. in the eight point. And by that time, I was already ready. He looked back at the yearling, and all I remember is bringing that pin down, centering it in the crease. And the last thing I knew was all I saw was the Lunok going through the air, seeing it hitting the crease, seeing the arrow fall off the other side, him mule kick. <laughs> and watching him run as he was running I could see the blood coming out of the, out of the uh, entrance wound and then he went in front of my trail camera which is the funniest thing that was the only picture or video of a deer on that trail camera was him dying after, after shot him. yeah so then he ran Sweet. through the opening then he stopped and he stopped it for a minute a little bit um, behind the thick stuff and then he ran out about 50 yards and I watched him get the wobbles Sweet. And drop. So it was, I didn't know. We, I didn't know we were gonna get a kill story out of you too. That's I, awesome. I do. You know what? And that's actually this, so that, this buck here. Yeah, and that's yep. actually my biggest buck to date. So I haven't got him scored yet. Uh, the Texan was down there said he's mid one fifties. Yeah, that's a beauty. So I was definitely, definitely blessed with that deer. I took a lot of pressure off. So now here in Mass, to me, uh, I like to shoot mature deer if I can. Yeah. And. Um, so I took a lot of pressure off. So, I, I have no, so now I'm back to like, it's an obsession for me with trail cameras and my scent. It's an absolute obsession. When I go in there, sometimes it's, I love to see what I got on camera. Yep. And then actually shoot. I just sometimes. checked a few cameras right before you came. I just got a couple across the street and uh, dove down in there to check them. I love doing it too. Yeah. I was reading your story. Um, and So we've been recording, uh, but I'll introduce. We got Chad Whitcomb. Is that how you say yeah, it? Yeah, that's yep, it. From Backyard Scents, um, Massachusetts uh scent company is going to tell us all about scents all about what he does with scents and um you know let's start start with like so what do you do with your trail cameras and so uh, so basically um just like everybody else i started off with like um the old 35 millimeter cameras where you had to you know you had to go and get it developed and stuff like that whatever and yep. even the quality of deer um I, I grew up like any deer that came through you know i shot spike horn didn't matter to me and so forth and every deer and bow to me is it's definitely a trophy or whatever you want to shoot. Whatever in your eyes is a trophy is a trophy. I mean, and, I got to tell you, reading your thing, your, your story on your website, it did sound a lot like me too. I mean, that's the same exact story. Grew up shooting spikes. I mean, yeah. even when you said you know, your dad used to hunt and see 10 bald deer and a, yeah. and a, and a spike following it. Yeah. This week, this I went I went up to Vermont for uh, one weekend of hunting this year. We got a deer camp and uh, I saw 10 deer and nine of them were does and the other one was a spike. So, I mean, it, it doesn't change. You can you can find some big, big bucks up there, but the doe to buck ratio yeah. um you know, it was yep. heavily, heavily in favor of the does. Um, but yeah, I grew up killing spike horns, killing does. Um, but I'm as I move here and I'm starting to see bigger bucks around and I'm starting to get into it a little bit more, I'm passing. I passed a lot of deer this year. I tell you what. It feels the, good. Yeah, you know what, man? Because the other thing, too, that uh, doing this whole thing with, with the cameras and research and, you know, everybody says it's so easy to shoot a deer with everything we have as far as technology. But I'll tell you what. Um these deer senses, man, what what they just know. They know when you're in the woods. They yeah. know when you walk in. They know when you're out. Um, it's like walking into your house. You know when someone's in there. And uh, their senses are just so high as far as their smell and their eyesight and their hearing. It's crazy. Um, you think you got them fooled, and the next thing you know, you get, it's like ghost town where your cameras are. You know, you get to follow that one hot though, what's going on. Mm-hmm. But I did a lot of research, and I started off with one camera. And... Um, and I just, you know, grew and, and it's amazing the piece of woods that you hunt. Like you can put a camera on a run. And then I started getting into video mode because pictures would miss a lot to me. Yep. I didn't like pictures because pictures, That's you'd always see me. a deer with its head up and looking behind your camera. Yep. So when I started putting um, on video mode, for me, it was a huge tool for the scent because 
I abuse my scent to make sure that I get the most honest product possible. I want to make sure that I have that guy that has one day to go hunting. I have that guy, it's a family guy, his wife gives him an afternoon to hunt. I mean, I'm a family man. I've hunted five times in Massachusetts this year in bow. And, um, and I did see one of my shooters. I, you know, I, I probably did okay with sitting and all that, and, but just tweaking, tweaking from going from shooting the spike horn, the four point, and the Massachusetts saying is, if you don't shoot it, the next person on a run is going to shoot it. Mm-hmm. I have seen a lot of deer grow that were not shot. Yep. And even the fact of you hear all those shots during shotgun and all that, honestly, a lot of those people don't know their guns and don't shoot their guns. And it's uh, a lot of these deer survive. And they're probably shooting whatever they see too. You yeah. Know, they're not necessarily yeah. waiting for big and, you ones. Know, and, and that's not a problem because if, if you're a meat hunter or that's what you're out there for, that's why you're hunting. Mm-hmm. It's, you're legal to shoot a legal deer then good for you. I, I have no, no problems against that at all. Um, I just choose to tend. I mean, I, now I see like deer that can grow and man from one year from like three and a half to four and a half. It's amazing the difference in they grow and the antler growth and uh, body size and everything. And I love seeing them. Sitting in a stand and fooling a deer and, and watching them walk underneath you and not letting you know that you're there or they don't know you're there to me is a feat. Yeah. And then just watching them how cautiously and how much they stand and just watch we're so fast to go through the woods, and they're just sitting there watching us. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, had a buck come in and stand in the same spot without flinching a muscle, maybe moving his ear back, backwards, you know. But yep. they'll be there for 10 minutes without moving anything. And then they might make the slightest move. It's just nose back to the ground, smell the ground a little bit. You just see turn, the Turn ears. around, but they start to slowly yeah. get back in. But they'll stand still there for 10, 15 minutes, and that feels like forever it, when you're watching them it does if you try to do a still hunt that's what you should do but i actually have one shooter buck i actually posted the uh the, the link to it he stood in front of my my trail camera for 16 minutes yeah he sat there and he only moved like two steps but he looked and his ears were back forth right left and just he sat there and just looked around yep. and it's kind of like almost like in this little pine knoll where he knew he had a little bit of cover but he sat there for legit 16 minutes I've never had that happen as far as a good sized deer that that was. He's a he's a nice shooter, eight point, but uh, that's how they catch us. Yep. You know, so. And and that really does humble you when you're still hunting too. When you see stuff like that from the stand or on your cameras, um, you realize like, no matter what, when you're still hunting, you're going too fast. Yeah, we can you, never you, be you, as patient as a yeah, deer. <laughs> you think you're going slow and you think you're taking your time, but you're yep. really you yep. gotta you gotta go. I don't know. 100 yards and take take 10 minutes, 15 minutes to go 100 yards. Yeah, yeah shorten your steps up, not yeah. long, you know, keep your short strides, you know, and it's just easy because now you're not reaching uh, to step over a log and hit a stick that you want to hit. Those shorter steps are definitely uh, help you out and keep you focused. So you were saying, so tomorrow's the opener of gun season in Mass, and you were saying it's going to be raining. What do you like to do? Do you hunt in the rain? Do you like, because I do like still hunting in the rain. There's actually, I mean, actually, recently, um, checking my cameras during, we had a, um, I forget what day it was, I think it was Friday, we had a lot of rain came through, and it went out actually about noontime. Mm-hmm. I said, it's a good time to go check some cameras, I know deer are going to be moving, and I came to an opportunity that, um, and this is how it happens, I mean, to try to explain when you get that, the buck fever, or the excitement you get when you have that, so I was walking in, and um, it was a piece I kind of like had some cameras in. And I kind of slept on it. I should have been more active to it because it was a lot of good sign. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very thick area. And I was walking in, getting fallen a run about five yards off the run just to watch it. And it was a, a scrape every 12 yards and a rub. I mean, it was torn up. Yeah. And it's a mint funnel between thick and swamp uh, where they just go naturally, natural funnel. So as I'm walking, I stepped over the stone wall. I had a little bit of a knoll in front of me. And I stepped over the wall and looked, and there's a 10-pointer standing right there, feeding, <laughs> feeding broadside, about 30 yards. This is in mass? This is in mass. I, yeah. actually, I actually videotaped it first. It's actually on my, um, it's on my website. And, um, and so I came up, and I'm sitting there looking at it, and your first instinct is like, wow, it's got a rack on that thing. I mean, he's, he was probably a three-and-a-half-year-old 10-point, mm-hmm. uh, but he was young. He didn't have a big body. Uh, he, I mean, his horns, I mean, he would, he probably would score like in the 120 somewhere around there if I had to guess, but he had so much potential. He, he had kickers coming off his G2s, little kickers started. I'm like, man, one more year, he's going to be a giant, but I'm sitting there and I eat tags every year in Massachusetts. I <laughs> eat my buck tags yep. every year. Um, 
one deer is good for me as far as meat. I do, you know, get a, a road kill on occasion here and there. So I'm not pressured or nor do I need to shoot a deer to feel like I'm a hunter or a sportsman, I like to say. And um, so I came up on him and so I said, you know what? I'm going to videotape this deer. I had my camera hanging, so I was videotaping it. Did you my, have your bow too? I had my bow. Yeah, yeah. So I put the bow down and that little <laughs> bit of a knoll was nice because I was kind of standing in the opening. And um, next to a tree, I always learn when you walk and you stop. Yep. Stop next to a tree. That is great advice. Yes. You're always going to have something next to you. Yeah. So I had a little hand walk kind of like next to me, but it wasn't in between us. It was to my left. So I started filming and this buck, man, I, I was watching him and he was eating his acorns so fast like he was drooling. And he would snap his head up and look back down. And the most craziest thing was I could feel the wind in the back of my neck going right at him. Yeah. But I think the way that Noel was, it was kind of like pushing it up over him because he was not catching my wind at huh. all. And um, so I'm sitting there watching him, watching him. I said, man, so this deer is feeding his way to me. Now he's like, he's about 28 yards broadside walking in. I'm like, oh boy. So then I start sizing him up again. You know, I'm like, listen, I still got two tags. I have some nice deer I want to I want to harvest. But, you know, I mean, this is bow. It's I'm on the ground. This is something I've never done before. Yeah. I would have shot. <laughs> Dude, I, I tell you what, he was making me think. And then as he's working his way in, and I said, if this deer comes any closer, I, I better, you know, put a, put a stick in and get ready. So sure enough, head down, man. He uh, works right into me. I think about 25 yards. And then he turns broadside. I said, oh. I'm like, I can't miss this opportunity. And the same time I'm looking at this deer, I'm kind of like looking to the right and to the left. See the other bucks that are in the area, any bigger bucks. Um, he was by himself. So I grabbed the bow and uh, definitely once you, once you have that instinct, what's going to happen, uh, you start getting the shakes. Yeah. So, and I love the shakes. Oh, especially on the ground. If I ever lose the shakes, I'm done hunting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because you know what? That's part of the thrill of the hunt. So I'm trying to knock the arrow and I can't even get the knock into the arrow. And finally I get the knock in the arrow and I'm looking at him and he's broadside head down. I said, this, this can't even be, this is like a dream. And I said, you know what? He's respectable for Massachusetts. He's a three and a half year old ten point. Um, not the body size I wanted. I said, but I think I'll be happy with him. And even though the conversation right now seems like it's a long time, it's a very short time being there. And uh, so I pulled the bow back. And that sense I was telling you about earlier, he snapped his head and looked right at me. So now it's kind of a point. I'm like, now I'm feeling like rushed because this deer is looking straight at me. Put the pressure on me. I, I didn't even settle the pin. I just sat there like my, you know, my yeah. mouth wide open, <laughs> eyes as big as could be, and hit the trigger and shot over his back about a foot. Yeah. And uh, I watched my arrow sail about 100 yards. And uh, that buck, you know, he, he took off and he blew. And I'm watching him. As I'm watching him looking at his horns and trying to size him up, I had instant relief because mm -hmm. as much as I, I would be happy with shooting that deer, I wouldn't have been because I did shoot a nice deer in Illinois. And it's kind of a conflicting thing as far as when you try to explain it. But I was in the moment, and I'm saying it's a respectable deer. it would be a great bow deer. But I would love to see that deer mm -hmm. next year, yeah. four and a half. I was going to say, you probably felt, you know, kind of relieved after you, know, you I, missed I, I was. I actually did. I did a, uh, I did a, I think I ended up doing a little video. And with my excitement and being happy and knowing that deer wasn't injured. Mm -hmm. But um, it's excitement. I mean, it's part of the hunt and, you know. I, I try to shoot ethically and do what I possibly can as a, as a clean kill and, and shoot right. And with that moment, there's just so much that goes through your mind and not being in the stand, but being on the ground at their level, being that close was uh, something very new to me. Yeah. Um, so I watched him run off and, and I felt good about it. And um, I'm glad he wasn't hurt. And since then, I've I put a new, a new set in, a new stand. And uh, within 26 hours, he's already hit my other scrape. On ascent, hit the licking branch. He's he's still in the same area, doing the same thing. Yeah, so yeah. hopefully he gets a little smarter for shot. And you can see him next year now. Hopefully. Yeah, so hopefully I can see him next year. But there is a there's a giant eight pointer in there, a really really nice thick eight point, big body. So I don't want to mess that area up, and uh, I'd like to hold out for him. Now, do you run cell cams, or you run regular cams, or a combination, or? <sighs> so this is the thing. This is the reason for I'm still. I actually just bought my my first two cell cams. I haven't got them out there yet. Um, I have like 35 to like 38 cameras out right now. And um, most of them are on um, on rubs or most of them are on my mock scrapes or a natural scrape that I've taken over through the years. And um, I believe, you know, an average deer, every time it hits a scrape, 
um, urinates six to eight ounces every time. And so when we're going out there with scent and we're putting a couple of droplets on there, whatever we're doing, heat, whatever you know people have and so forth, or licking branch or whatever, we're not putting a nearly amount as much that they're actually leaving. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're leaving like like what we normally do when we play, yes. you know? So when people say, you know, when they ask me about, I get a lot of stories like, you know, what should I put out there? I'm like, well, my main thing is be, is be the freshest scrape in the woods. Mm-hmm. Keep it open. Um, deer just have that, it's, they have that weird thing about fresh earth when they see it or a fresh scrape. They gotta go see what's going on. Yeah. See who's there. It's a commu- it's a communication. You know, they all go there, see who's who's around and who's coming through. And what I like about using scent is you bring in, you know, fresh does, and then you bring in an intruder buck. So if you get a mature buck that's in the area, he sees this scrape constantly being freshened. Now he has these does coming in. Now he has, has these other bucks coming in. He's like, what's going on? So you make them want to visit that scrape more and more. And he's and like, I've never smelled that buck before. Exactly. Yeah. And then you see a doe, so now it's like competition. So hopefully you're going to try to break his habits a little bit and kind of get him to be a day walker. So you put two kinds of scents? You put a doe scent and, a, and an intruder buck when you so what I do, scrape? Yeah, so what I do is um, because naturally when a deer goes through a scrape, um, the bucks are going to urinate on a tarsal glands. Mm-hmm. And um, and they're also going to you know go to licking branch. Um, so they're actually leaving – a lot of their scent from from glands that they have, so now you look at that. So now you got a licking branch from a buck, and then you have you know the tarsal gland from a buck. So that's two different scents. It ain't the same scent. So I go in and I always I always I call it the four pack, as I go in with buck buck and doe licking branch buck and doe scrape, and I have a preseason. Then I have you know just like the regular season that's in and out. To me, the magic time is like November seventh to like. I mean, I, I'd go to end of the boat at 29th because I see what I, what I work with to make the scent. But there's a, there's a small two to three week period, I believe, is the real, real hot area as far as these deer at, at the peak estrus. So I have a very limited supply of um, the rut because I'm, I'm trying to be the honest, most um, kind of like out, outspoken about what I have. And I'm not trying to sell something I don't have. Mm-hmm. So when I tell you I have the rut, it's going to be in that time period. I have everything labeled. It's everything's there, and it's from that time period, um, and so forth. So, um, I'm trying to give you the most honest product I have. So, I go buck and doe licking branch, buck and doe scrape every time. All right. So let's break that down. Um, and and you don't um, when you say November seventh is when like when you like to start putting your scents on the scrapes because I I saw scrapes starting end of September this year. I'll go all the way through. Now, so my okay. pre-seasons for that. All right. So it's more of a curiosity. And it's where, not, there's no estrus in it. You don't want to, because that might spook a deer. Right? So I don't have any estrus at all in mine. Okay. There's no estrus at all in mine. So mine, so it's a big question. I get a lot of questions of like, what do you use? Yeah. What's, what's in it? Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you use? How do you get it? Yeah. How do you get it or how do you make it? And that's yeah. like, I mean, so my answer is I try to help everybody out, whether you're novice or, you know, you've been hunting your whole life and stuff like that. I try to be as straight as I can and, you know, I mean, do you call these other, these other companies and ask them how they make their scent and what's in it? You just buy it from the store and get it, you know, get it delivered or whatever. Yeah. So what I can tell you is that there's no urine in it because urine turns to ammonia very quickly and um, it will work. And then you also have different deer that will like it, hit the scrape or some deer will just walk by it and keep on going. Mm-hmm. Deer, whatever the stage they're in, sometimes the scents work. It's just another tool but you also have to do a lot of scouting and a lot of you know preseason scouting and work to find where the deer are. You put scent out, you make a mock scrape, you ain't gonna have a 150 class buck walk in. Yeah, you're gonna be in that area, and it takes a, sometimes the woods I'm hunting now. The woods I'm hunting now, I always get small bucks on camera until you learn to fine tune the small scrapes that turn into big scrapes or the runs that you miss, and then you just put it all together with all the years of sign that you got. Now I'm getting shooters on my cameras in, in woods I've hunted my whole life and didn't see them. Mm-hmm. And then some some different spots of those uh, woods will change. will be hot one year, hot over here, hot over there. You just got to kind of move with that. So um, so I put it all – I do it to four cents because I know that when I see the bucks coming in on my cameras and the videos show it, they come in and it seems the licking branch, they seem to spend a lot more time on the licking branch. They're really getting into the preodal gland, the nasal gland, the forehead gland, all that. Those three or four glands that's on the head alone is a lot for the licking branch. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge communication. You'll see them chew on it. That's why I call it licking branch. I got videos of bucks licking the scent, you know, or chewing the leaves or whatever it is. 
And that shows me a lot how much they really get involved, closing their eyes, and they're really hammering it, oh, yeah. even with the dose. Yeah. Um, so, but honestly with me, um, you ask me questions, I'll stay as right as I can. There is no shelf life on this scent whatsoever. Mm. The longer it sits, the better it is. Um, it never goes bad. Yeah. Just don't leave it on your dashboard when it's 80 degrees. Yeah. You know, just keep it out of the sun. Keep it in the garage, probably fine. God, you don't have to even keep it cool. Just keep it out of the out of the way of you know, direct sun, and uh, you should be good to go. And uh, I've changed from licking branch with gel. Now, well, I have so your four cents though. You see, so you got the dough, and it's the dough orbital gland or gland, and then you've got what? What's the one that you put in the scrape? Is so it- I have a so I have the scrape. So basically, um, for the scrape is toxal gland mm-hmm. and interdigital gland. Mm-hmm. Now. Um, most people don't understand about the interdigital gland, but that's a very, very powerful scent. At a between very, the hoof, between the hoof, yeah, um, it's on, it's between both all hoofs, front and back. Uh, but it's a very, very powerful um, gland, and 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 a little bit is dropped, and with that drop right there, they can identify who is who, they can identify which way they walked, what stage they're in in their rut, extra cycle, and the dominancy they are. That's a lot for one. That's for crazy. One scent to leave down. Yeah. So now I, from that, and more people getting into that, I've added this year um, the interdigital uh, scent bottle just by itself because it's a good um, agent to use for dragging, drag rags, even with a scrape. So the scrape scent actually has interdigital in it and tar- uh, tarsal into it. Mm-hmm. It has both. Mm-hmm. Um, there is also another metatarsal gland that's on the leg, but... As far as what they think that does, it's just more or less, I think it, it's more temperature. They don't know much about that gland, but that doesn't play any role inside the scrapes. All right. So with everybody doing their Christmas shopping, um, I'm sure a lot of you are procrastinating and you're looking for something to get. Um, I got to remind you of one of the best Christmas gifts of all time. It's an old staple. And that's a bottle of wine or a case of wine. And if you're going to be buying wine, I know most people listening to this podcast have bought wine or regularly buy wine. Um, Don't go to the store during COVID. Dude, just go online. Go to heronhill.com. Check out what they got. My favorite is their Eclipse Red. I'm a big red guy, but they're known for their whites. But hey, get on there. Support your favorite podcast. Support your favorite podcast's biggest sponsor. And get some great gifts for Christmas. And it also is going to enter you into the New Year's raffle. Every bottle of wine you buy from now until the end of the year is going to get you one entry into our big New Year's raffle. So, I mean, look, there's like four positive things there. Plus, it's just really great wine. So, remember, use code HS5 for an additional 5% off at checkout. That'll let them know that you heard about their wine from us. And if you buy a whole case with HS5, you're going to get 20% off total plus free shipping plus some amazing gifts, and you're showing your support for us and our sponsors. So thank you very much. Heron Hill Winery, the official wine of hunters, and more importantly, their wives and girlfriends everywhere. Look, I hate ticks. You hate ticks. I know you hate ticks. I know your parents hate ticks. I know your kids hate ticks. We all hate ticks. You know what I want to do to ticks? I want to kill them. You know how you do that? Sawyer permethrin not only repels ticks, Keeps them off your clothes, but if they do happen to get on there, it'll kill them. They only have to go over an inch and a half of your clothing that's been treated with soy or permethrin to die. What's better than that? Maybe killing a big buck, but this is a close second. These guys are an amazing company. They're U.S. based. They're family owned and operated. Look for the yellow bottle. You can find them in Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop, Dick Sporting Goods, Moose Jaw, REI. Find them online. Whatever you got to do, get soy or permethrin. It is not expensive. It'll save your life from these diseases that ticks carry. And use a quick application. You spray it on your clothes, spray it on your hat, put it on your socks and shoes, put it on your backpack, let it dry outside in the breeze, and it dries odorless. The deer are not going to pick you off from putting this stuff on your clothes. I guarantee you, get Sawyer Permethrin. You won't regret it. So you have that gland, um, you have a doe and a buck version of that, and you spray yep. both of those in your scrapes. Yep. So yep. those are those are in squirt form. So um, yep. I had the scrape that has into digital and scrape. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, in a tarsal gland. Yep. And then in the um, licking branch is a nasal 
uh, salivatory gland that's in the mouth they chew, uh, forehead, and preorbital. Preorbital is in the corner of your eyes, basically yep. where you get those crusties. Right. They have the same thing. And, and you have a buck and doe version of that yep. too. Yep. yep. Yeah, everything I have is all buck and doe version. Um, I think across the board, I have 18 different scents. Um, and then I also have uh, what I added this year was the uh, Matriarch uh, Doe Scrape, which is uh, it's all uh, more mature does, yep. over 130 pounds. Um, so if you want to bring a little bit more scent to the game as far as like whether you're hunting, it, it, it depends on the class of deer you're hunting. Because I also have the 200 and the Buck 200. Yeah, Kevin was telling me about that one. He's... So this stuff, I mean, if you're going to put it out, like I, I tell people like there's dominancy, there's, there's subdominant bucks. And um, these are all bucks over 200 pounds. And um, it doesn't doesn't mean by them being 200 pounds that they're a dominant buck in the area. But those are the, I go with a bigger, um, the bigger bucks. And if they, you know, typically the ones that are 200 pounds are, are usually pretty big um, as far as antler wise. wise and, yeah. yeah, and yep. so forth and all. But it doesn't mean they're completely dominant. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a source of I keep it 200 pounds and over. And you're bringing your dominancy level a little bit up. Yeah, so if you do that, you might be scaring away some one if and a half, you, two and If and you're hunting year everything, I tell people, yep. I say, if you're hunting everything, subdominant bucks, small bucks, it's probably not a good idea to use it because it could kick out your subdominant bucks. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why it's a different line. And then I just I added the uh, the rut scent, which is the doe scrape and, and the uh, the buck scrape as well, which is during that time of I, I think like I say from the seventh to like the twenty fifth around there, that three week period, I make I make that scent during that time. And then um, like I said earlier, into digital gland for both buck and doe. Uh, everything I have is two ounce bottles. And then this year, I also made um, the licking branch. Yeah, I had it for gel when I first started, but now I have it in spray form. And the reason for the spray form is because um, when you're walking into your stand, if you're early in the morning and stuff like that, instead of unscrewing that lid and trying to like put the gel on a licking branch, now you can go up there and spray it with both the buck and doe. Yeah. And then, you know, if you want, if you got a few more spots that within your shooting range, you can hit them on the branches at a good height. Mm -hmm. And then even when you're in the, uh, up in a tree stand and you're rattling, um, or grunting or calling, you can spray that into the air, and you just see you just see it disperse and go out. I make scrapes. I walk away, and eighty yards away, I can still smell. Mm -hmm. I can still smell the licking branch all from the uh, yep. from the spray. And so, what's your reason for not using or incorporating um, urine? Because it turns to ammonia. Oh yeah, right. Because uh, so <clears throat> basically, it, it breaks down, and because um, I, I peed in a scrape this year, and a, 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 a buck was in it fifteen minutes later. Yep. But, but I don't think I think he was just walking by, and he happened to smell the ammonia. I don't think. Well, the other thing is too is I mean, it's not. I'm not saying it doesn't work, and a lot of people do that. Yeah. It what works for you. Yeah. Um, some guys will say no way, I'll have a pee in my scrape, and some guys will say yeah, it works. It's still a form again. Bucks and doe, you know, leaving their scent in a scrape is from urine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a source of fluid that brings that scent down. Um, and just the reason for me is sometimes, like, if you can't use the scent for that year, you can put it away. You don't have to, you don't have to store it in a refrigerator, but it's still good for next year. It doesn't mm -hmm. go bad. Yep. The other scent, you keep opening it up. If you don't use it and it sits through the year, it's yeah. going to be complete ammonia. Yeah. You know, yep. so... I don't want to get involved in that. Also, the other thing is, too, is that with some things, um, obviously the CWD, where I just had a meeting uh, recently, uh, a Zoom with uh, the biologist from Connecticut, and my scent is now, it's I actually, I think at the, at the time, right now, it's the only legal natural scent um, allowed for Connecticut because you can't use any uh, urine-based scent um, in Connecticut unless it's a deer that you shot from the state. Huh. And so I had a meeting with them, talked about my scent. So my scrape scent you can't use there because of the fact of um, even though my deer uh, are local deer and it's not in that CWD area, but anything that associates with, with their law from the tarsal gland that can hold the urine – and that's how, because the CWD yeah. is a prion. Yeah, it's a prion, right? And it's yep. only, uh, it's passed through urine. Yep, and yep. And they it, haven't found any way. They've tested that and put that under a thousand degrees and it still didn't die. I mean, uh, and you, it can even, like wherever they pee, it can get into the plants around, you know, right? It's spread by the, yeah, it's spread by the, uh, it's spread by the feces and by the urine. And um, so. But it, another deer could come by and eat that plant and get yep. it, right? And they and once they get it, this, right now there's no, there's I mean they have nothing for it that the deer can get rid of it. So yeah. unfortunately, it's a bad thing. So I'm trying to be you know part of a solution, not part of a problem. Um, 
then trying to use this all synthetic sense is, is hard as well. Um, so I try to gravitate. I got a bunch of friends that are in Connecticut and so forth. And I have a lot of good people sending me stuff, but people are scared to, to share their their pictures or videos and all because they don't want people to know what's <laughs> where they are or what's going on. So I get a lot of secret like messages. I'm like, you got to post that on the site. <laughs> These people got to know what's going on. But just just make up a different town. <laughs> yeah. Well, I usually I usually put on a customer, you know, sent this in and so forth just to share it because it's good to see in action. You can see all my videos, but I know it's also nice to see customers post things up and what what their experience is yep. and uh, as far as staying with it. So, but um, Oops. you get it. <laughs> <laughs> playing with my wedding ring there and <laughs> flew it off so but yeah I, I like the cameras like I said man it's, it's an addiction going to cameras and seeing what's on there and trying to study in the habit and and I and another thing is is like as far as like being family orientated I love seeing families go out with the memories and um, you know seeing them post up a, a harvest with my scent uh, those stories keep, keep me driving to get you know more out there more involved. Um, I've even, you know, dated, donated so much to people that go out there with their first year and say, "Hey, here's this. Here's a four pack for free," because it's good to see. Mm-hmm. This day and age right now, 2020 has been a, a tough year, and um, I like to see a lot of new people out there and kind of like help them get an edge. But you're still gonna put the pieces of the puzzle together, yep. and this scent is just another tool that you gotta use with what you do in your scouting. So being a big scent guy and uh, loving scrapes, you have to have shot bucks while making a scrape before, right? Or no? So because my first this year, my I got my best buck of my life, and he was making a scrape at, at thirty yards. That's killed him making a scrape. That's awesome to see, man. Um, so basically, with me, the funny thing is, is that like because of what I do, I do a lot of different things as far as work. And I really don't get much time out at all during uh, bow hunting. Yep. Very. If I get five, six days a year in bow hunting, that's really good for me. Uh, mostly half days and so forth. Do you whatever. go to the Illinois every year and do that trip? Actually, so I never left because every I used to go to New Hampshire and hunting. Uh-huh. But it always seems the time you leave is the peak time in Massachusetts or anywhere. Yeah, it's yeah. the week of the 12th. Like I never want to go anywhere. So I stopped doing New Hampshire. And then um, unfortunately this year, I say unfortunately, uh, a buddy of mine uh, got a uh, bad uh, diagnosis with uh, brain cancer, oh, terminal. And um, so uh, it, it came up to me a couple of weeks before they were going to leave and go on a trip. They did the trip last year. They've been out to Illinois for five years. Uh, I was invited on this trip as a bunch of boys to go out. And uh, I'm glad I did. And I went out and uh, it was just all, all about making memories and uh, together yeah. and, and the base is what it's about. And trying to get him uh, as many you know deer as he's legally to shoot, mm-hmm. and uh, so we went out, and uh, I was blessed with that ten pointer, which is my biggest deer to date, and actually my first deer uh, shot with my brand new Matthews. That's two years old, so it's it's actually a, a good way to break it in, I guess. Awesome, yeah, I would say. So Illinois was my first year uh, going out there because of that, huh. and I'm uh, I'm glad I did. It, it worked out well, and it was some awesome, awesome memories. So that was a that was a good trip. Yeah, that's good. So yep. hunting is all about making memories and for sure, for sure. So, but as far as the scent game comes, I have some new, uh, new ideas for next year. Um, you know, and, and just trying to follow what everybody does and what, what I want to see. And, um, so I'm trying to get different products available, easy enough things for people to do and, uh, give them, it's an actual hundred percent natural scent. And, um, there's no line about it and how I make it is how I make it, <laughs> you know, but I, I, I'm not, I can't lie to you about it, but, uh, there'll be some new things coming out next year. So you can stay tuned to watch for that. And I'm going to try to keep it, um, up with the times here and give more options. Yeah. You know, different yeah. ideas. I'm trying to think outside the box with a lot of different things. So. so check out this scrape. This is like, this is probably the ideal. I mean, I, I where did that go? He was okay, like, yeah. you see him just loving that branch closing his eyes just like you were saying um, it's it's awesome to watch yeah, them, really, they really work into it yep like now, i th- used to put my cameras up just random places you know um and but really the best place and the only place it should be a scrape line you know i guess rubs they don't visit the rubs as much as they do the scrapes you don't you'll, you'll be surprised though. i'll tell you what the last few years i've actually kind of like started really getting into the rubs and this brings up this actually brings up um, some things I want to touch base about, about as far as your setup. 
because people will ask me how you do your setup mm -hmm. and how do you figure out where you are. I mean, obviously intersected runs, natural funnels or natural lines or eco habitats. So if you get a hardwood section that runs into a hemlock grove, uh -huh. that line where the hardwoods meet that meets yep. the hemlocks. It's an edge for them. It's a it, 100% because what they're going to do is the, the bucks will travel that, make their rubs, make their scrape line. And if there's any pressure, they can jump into the thick stuff back and forth, whatever it might be. It could just be vines, could be bittersweet, it could yep. be anything. Mm -hmm. So I find a lot of those areas. And um, the reason for my mock scrapes or the setups I have is because of the fact of taking them off the focus of you being around and any movement you're going to make to draw your bow or pull your gun, stand up, whatever you're going to do. And I try to make it so when they come in, they're already naturally broadside to me. Right, And yeah, they're yeah. looking away from me because sometimes <clears throat> you set up a scrape and a deer come in and they're looking up at the scrape right at you. Yeah. At the looking branch. Yeah. So now you can't even move because it's staring right at you. Yeah. They won't, might not see you, but... So I try to set my sets up to where they come in and, I, and I'm completely broadside to that run and to that scrape setup so I can pull back, take them off, you know, off me and they're just getting into it. And as you see, they close your eyes and they really get into it, put their head down, put the antlers into it. So you try to preoccupy their time yep. as far as what they're Distract getting. them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, distract them as much as you can. And what do you do? Set up 25 yards, 20 yards off? Typically 25 yards. Yeah. Um, I like to kind of like be up close and personal um, because I also try to film my hunts, which is uh, a whole other game. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I try to get as much as I can on camera because I still can use that to see um, what I need to do or what I need to change. I just love watching film over yep. and over and over. It's fun doing it. It really is So fun. much fun. So much fun. I had my camera rolling for that nine-pointer this year, but he had, he came in um, from behind me, So I did, and I don't have like uh, anything fancy for a camera setup. I use my phone, and I have uh, this little spider thing that wraps around, a little rubber tripod yep, yep. that wraps around my, uh, my stand. Um, so I couldn't. You know, I was standing up and he came from behind me. I couldn't angle it the right way. I turned it a little bit and then I got nervous that if I tried to mess around with it anymore, yeah. you know, he was going to spot me. So I just yep. left it there. But you can hear it and still that's cool and you get all the recovery footage. And yeah, no, it's, that's definitely, I mean, it's awesome. I got close a few times. My biggest deer um, that I shot, uh, man, it's, it's got to be going on six, seven years ago. It was actually a tough year for me. It was a year that I lost my, uh, my son. And uh, he oh, he, that, he passed away from a terminal um, disease, and um, so he was he was also a gift to me as well. Having him for 21 months that I had him, and he taught me strength. He taught me a lot of a lot of things. And that year, I went into the woods and uh, determined to, to shoot a good buck. And uh, there was this one rub I always remembered. And this is before I started using scents. Um, well, I used scents, but I didn't have my scents going yet, and so forth. I had a buddy making scents back in the day that. He since passed away, and um, oh, man. so this this first beginning of the uh, of the year, um, I was onto this rub. It was on a, it was a, a signpost. I mean, it was on a tip of a tip of a swamp coming from the cornfields, and the rubs that led to this rub it was the, it was the last rub that was fresh. And then I, I could tell the way he was going. It was to his bedding, so there wasn't much sign after that. But there was older rubs, so I was getting on him on camera. He didn't have a big rack, but he was a huge, huge body. And um, so I got him eating some apples early in the year because we, we didn't, haven't had really good acorn crops. Um, God, I think the last five, six, seven, eight years, this was a phenomenal year yeah, this, this year. Yeah, this year was nuts. Oh, it was crazy. I mean, you can tell about the deer, the body weight, but um, in there, obviously their racks. But So I finally got into this deer. It was, it was the first Saturday um, in Bow. October 26th, I remember it was. I think it was the first Saturday. Yeah, it was the first Saturday. It was a late season that year. It was like the 22nd it started for some reason. So I was sitting in this stand, and a deer came underneath me, underneath me um, probably about 15, 20 minutes before light. And then as I was sitting there, I heard something. I kept hearing something down by this hemlock rub. I could see it. It was about 80 yards away. And um, finally I looked down, and I could see something moving. And I see this buck coming up through, and I could see its horns. And I wasn't realizing what deer that was. And so I videotaped him coming in, and then I saw the body, and I realized it was the deer that I was after. And uh, this deer walked in nine yards. <laughs> so typically my sets are like 25 feet in the air. I'm average 25 feet. So this deer is underneath me. So I'm like back in the camera out and trying to turn my camera to where he's stopping. 
And the wind started doing a little bit of swirliness in there. And I'm like, I can't have this. I got way too nervous. So I, I let go of the camera. And as I had him underneath me, I had the camera on him. He actually took like two more steps out of the frame. And I wasn't going to mess around with that. So you know what, man? <laughs> I'm, I got to shoot this deer. So I ended up shooting that deer. And I turned the camera as he ran off. And uh, I saw where he went, kind of filmed where he went, and uh, he walked off real slow with his tail tucked, and he was flicking it. And uh, I walked out, and I ended up calling my cousin and uh, getting my father out there, and we waited three hours. And we kept playing the video over. Even though you can't see the shot, you can hear the shot. And I knew, you know, the deer was kind of like quartering to me, but I was so, quartering to me slightly, but I was so high up that I was kind of like shooting above the crease, kind of like down in. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt good with the shot because when he took off, the arrow almost completely passed through. The only thing that was left was the fletching and the knock on the opposite side of his body. So we waited, and uh, we get in there, and we found where I shot, and we were walking and walking, and, and I know where he went through the stone wall, so no blood whatsoever. And uh, never found the arrow. Well, never found the arrow before that. And then we're, we're walking, and I see this one little spot of blood the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. And as we're sitting there, looking for this deer. Um, I'm kind of like scanning the horizon and so forth, whatever, trying to find this deer. My cousin, M Matt, who's colorblind, looks over and says, what is that on the ground? And I looked out about 60 yards and I can just see this, like it looked like a, it was like a rock, but it was just this <laughs> massive hump. And I'm looking and I can see, and everything just started like developing my eye. I can see the horns, I can see it. I said, oh my God, so that's him. So yes. I ran to the deer, ran over to it. My father and um, my cousin Matt held back and uh, had my moment because that was the year of my son. Had my moment with mm -hmm. that deer and just like everything that went into that deer, mm -hmm. um, the time passing on smaller deer, letting, letting them walk and then seeing the size of this deer. That deer and I'm dressing out 230 dressed. Wow. It was just an absolute beast of a deer. Again, he was only a seven, he was a real small, small rack. Like he, he was definitely probably going the other way because. He had good bases, but nothing for a rack at all. Mm -hmm. But a deer of that caliber and knowing that he did that, how he was a mature older deer, was just a, a good year for me. It was just a blessing to have that deer and, and to harvest that, that, that animal. So, Trophy Ridge products are intelligently designed to give you a distinct advantage and be deadly accurate. The team at Trophy Ridge believes smart, hunt-inspired innovation should be at the foundation of each product's existence. You have enough to worry about on a hunt. Your gear should not be one of them. Trophy Ridge accessories give you the comfort of always knowing you're using the best bow hunting equipment when out in the woods or at the range. For information on the all-new 2021 lineup of Trophy Ridge sights, quivers, rests, releases, and stabilizers, visit TrophyRidge.com. Trophy Ridge, the tools bow hunters trust. But that's uh, the work you put in. It's just the cameras setting back, moving. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, I notice people don't really care that you don't get the kill shot on camera. It's not like, you know, the old hunting shows. People don't like those old hunting shows anymore where it's all about that kill shot, yep, you know? Yep, And it looks easy, and it's, you know, that's... They don't like that. They like the get out and do it yourself, DIY yeah. filmer. They really, they really do. Yeah. Um, the guys are doing it up in Maine, tracking deer. And, yep. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to focus and it get really out is. going. It, it's yeah. hard. It's another job. It's another thing you <laughs> got to consider as it, if it wasn't hard enough. That's <laughs> why you have a camera guy because it's really, really hard to do it yeah. by, by yourself. So, yep. But but the, the level I've grown with the sense and um, getting more into it, I've been doing it for about eight years. And um, I live by my sense um, because I know, I know they work. Uh, but I also know that not every deer is going to come to a scrape mm -hmm. that's freshened up. With any sense. So, so be honest. Have you seen bucks hit? You know, on your cameras, you've been doing it for years and years. You had to have seen some of them get spooked by it, and then maybe did you tweak your scent or did you? So like, what happens is sometimes the biggest, I guess, I guess the thing is, is that your scent control, and that's another thing. And I, I was going to ask you about that too. What so do you that, do that's another thing. Scent? So I've, <laughs> I abuse. When I say I abuse my scent, and I and I try things out, and maybe I shouldn't, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm putting something out there that is going to be for everybody to use. Yep. And um, so when I say that, like sometimes my my scent control, it's not good at all. But I've learned because uh, going into like the licking branch, you're coming to a close spot where you got a deer that's going to smell and they're going there for the smell. Mm -hmm. And if you don't 
you know, I, people like will wear gloves and all that. But if you don't control your scent, deer are gonna are gonna get you. They're gonna wind you. And there's been some times to where I actually hit one of the branches. Yeah, and I see a deer come up. You don't want to share that because people will say, "Oh, well, you sent spooking yeah, deer." That's, that's, that's your yeah. They'll think it's but, your product, right? But or you know, someone sent that to me. I mean, it could be anything um, for that matter. But I've done that and I've had it happen. And I know that I should have either busted that branch off, took that branch off, so my scent's not on it. Uh, you'll see me on all occasions. I'll take a stick, and the way I make my licking branches is is, is a already a natural scrape there with, with a branch hanging over. Yep. I will hang a tuft of leaves with branches on it over that scrape because you know they want to they want to run their head, they want to run their antlers through something and leave that that scent. So I will put that branch hanging on there, and now what that becomes for me, you, you'll break one off from somewhere else. You'll, they're everywhere. You'll yeah, find them. Yeah. So if you look on the ground, you'll right. see like the oak leaves have a little tuft of leaves yeah. with a little you just small take one twig. Of those and hang it over the. I'll hang that over the scrape for the licking branch, mm-hmm. and now what you have is a natural licking branch that you can get a million of. And also because it's it's hard in Massachusetts where if you have anything hanging uh, that people can see, unfortunately, either it gets taken or damaged or whatever. So now if you've got a natural limb hanging in a tree, it doesn't look out of place yep. for the deer or for a hunter or whatever. So now I'll go back and every time I'll hit and refresh up that one particular licking branch or I'll also use that little tuft of leaves or a good leaf I'll clean the scrape out, and I'll put that one leaf back in the center of that scrape, and I'll keep using that, and that will be like my little scent pad. <laughs> and it, you know what? You, and you clean it out with your boots, right? And nope. the, No? What do you do? I use a stick. Okay. I use a good stick. I was going to say. Um, I'm very cautious with doing that now because I, I want to get uh, good video, and trust me, I want to shoot a good deer. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I try to like abuse what I can early in the season, and deer are more forgiven early in the season when mm-hmm. before the estrus and all that starts to happen, they're more forgiven, but... These when you get to bigger mature bucks, there you can't you can't fool them too many times and mess around with them because they're not gonna they're not gonna stay they're mm-hmm. out they're yep. they're not dumb that's why they're big, so I'll take a stick open the scrape up, I'll take a stick I'll hang the licking branch and I'll take a stick and I'll I'll put the leave in the center of the scrape. All right, I was gonna say so you don't touch that tough to leaves all. either at all. Yeah, because I, was... I had some customers call me and say yeah I just you know use my hands I'm like what. I said, no, you can't do that. I said, yeah. uh, either use a stick if it's a gel. Uh-huh. You can take a small stick the size of a pencil, mm-hmm. um, and you can use that to apply the gel. With the spray, you're going to spray anything. You know, it, it gives a good distance with it and all that. But as long as you don't hit any of that, you should be good to go. Okay. You know? Just take a stick, and then what do you do? Take the stick out with you or just throw it as far as you so can? So it's funny because if you, <laughs> if you want Because to. I, I bring a stick in a lot, too, like just to knock spider webs down and shit. Yeah. And, when I'm doing, and then I just make sure like toss that <laughs> I somewhere usually, where I don't think any deer is walking. That's what I do. Yeah. So my so the thing is that I have actually caught myself doing. It. I'll usually in a pile of brush and all that. I'll throw the stick into that. But it's funny because that stick has scent on it, and I'll see deer go to the scrape, and then I'll see them start sniffing and walking that way to the pile of brush. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah. shoot! I said, and I haven't had any incidents lately to where they went up to that stick and smelt it, but. I usually throw it in a direction that they're not, but they can be anywhere. But mm-hmm. I usually throw it somewhere where they can't get into or yeah. no need to get in there. You yeah. know? So. And actually, now that we're talking, I'm reminding, um, remembering two years ago, because we were talking earlier about um, the rubs. And I, I think I'm wrong about that because they do check the rubs a lot. Because I we, we had a, a, a my Vermont deer camp. We put a camera up right behind camp. There's normally some scrapes there, and it's an old log road. And... Uh, I had this camera up, and it caught this 10-pointer that my uncle um, ended up shooting later that year. Yep. And he went by the camera, and we saw him make a rub. There yep. was no rub there. We saw the first time he made the rub. Okay. And then um, uh, we would see the entire time that camera was there after that, every deer that like was running by the ridge, they might have been 25, 30 yards um, away from it. You could see them stop in their tracks. So the wind must have been going, you know, that way. Yeah. And you'd see right where the wind was and they would come right down to it, smell, smell the rub. And then they would, you know, even if they were a doe, they'd rub their head on it. Yeah. Um, and there were little bucks and they were hitting the rub too. Um, but every deer, like it was almost every deer. And even I think it's as much as 20 days, you know, where, where there were no deer going through 20 days later. You would see a deer yeah. still smell that they would yep. they would catch the wind of it and and smell it twenty days later. So that was cool. Well, when you say that, so when you as far as the rubs, um, a, a buck is laying down where he's walking, 
And when he, when he lays those rubs down, that, that's usually his travel corridor. So lately, if I find some good signposts, I, I, put a, I put a camera on that. I'll put my gel on it, the licking branch, because the licking mm-hmm. branch, so people know the licking branch uh, and a rub is, a, is the same exact glance that they use. Right. Okay. Yep. And um, so I'll do both. I'll put the, I'll put the licking branch gel or, or spray on, um, on, the, on the rub as well. And it's amazing the amount of deer that will actually will visit that and go by and check it out, see who's around, or see if that buck is around, or who's been around. Those checking them. It is an abs- during the day. Yeah, I was amazed by how many mature bucks in the day were checking that that rub. Now, do you see any different? What do you see? Is, is it better action than a scrape? Is it the same? Is it? I guess it's the area. Yeah, and, and it, how tight it is, or how big it is, and you know, um, I guess it's it the herd of deer that you have coming through there. But I, I think it's pretty much even uh, as far as what I see. But the scrapes seem to me to attract a lot more does and a lot more different caliber deer because everybody wants to see what's going on. So that's their scent way of saying, hey, is Sally still here? Is George yeah. here? Who's here? Yeah. You know. Yep. So I think the rubs play a big part in tying in the pieces of as far as your stand placement. Um, but as far as the scrapes and, uh, you know, the does coming by, and if, if, if the does come by, I actually recently just had a, um, a video I posted up where a doe came into, which is good to see. I know where scrapes were the year before, but I'll be the first one to open them up. And then so I kind of control that. And then when you start having other deer come here, which every one of my bottles has five different deer sent in it. So mm-hmm. it's five different deer in every one of my bottles. Okay. So typically when deer smell things, they're smelling Naturally, they say about five to six to eight deer at a time. Mm-hmm. So five seems to be a good number to have as far as that. So now you're bringing five different bucks, five different does. Um, and so when, when they come up and now they're leaving their scent, and now you got does that are curious, they come up and they leave their scent. I just recently had a, de- a doe come up, hit the licking branch, and then she ended up squatting and peeing in the scrape. Mm-hmm. That's awesome to see. That yeah. right there like, makes my season because yeah. I know that I'm going somewhere good with this. And either she smelt the buck and she knows that buck and she... You know, because there was a shooter eight pointer that came through, and so maybe she was saying, "Hey, I'm ready and I'm here." And that's yeah. what you want. That's what you want to see. Yeah. So, and that was a mock scrape that I started from a natural scrape that was saw the, the seasons before, but this year was so so weird with scrapes. Like some areas are really hammered, and some areas they go by, they smell them, hit the licking branch, but they don't touch the scrape. Yeah, but they'll still I did pee, see it some or they'll step off to the side, even five feet away, and they pee. Mm. You'll see them rub their tassels together. Mm-hmm. They'll, you know, and they'll pee down their leg and leave it, not directly in the scrape. Sometimes just on the outside. So when you find a nice scrape that is a natural scrape that a lot of lot of different deer are hitting it, you're gonna go back and open it up first next year. Yes. Oh you know, yeah. So and when do you do? What, what about what time do you open them up? So I try to get like early September because. Typically by second week of September, the deer and hard horn, and uh, they're starting. I mean, they deer you sent uh, use the scrapes all season long mm-hmm. for communication, licking branches. I mean, all season yep. long. If you kept a, a camera on a scrape, yeah, all season long they use it. That's another I saw, way. Yeah, I saw scrapes freshened up in the spring in yep. April. You know, I yep. saw fresh scrapes. Yeah. So I mean, if you, early you can go and, and try to find them growing. I was on to some nice bucks this year. It was a good group of bucks. Um, some really nice bucks actually together. It was like three big eight points and, um, got them all, got them all spring and kind of like, you know, in the summer and into the fall. And then as hunting season opened up and stuff like that, whatever, I got one nice one still coming through, but the rest of them, I mean, they could have been harvested. I don't, I don't know, but they will show up because I know towards the end of the season after shotgun's done, these deer are still, still walking through. I still haven't come, come on cameras, but I try to get in the scrapes as early as I can in uh, early early September, even early if I can in August. Because if they're coming through um, as they're growing, still in velvet, I try to get as much information on that deer, that area as that I can. And you kind of see what you have for deer coming through. Yep. And uh, um, because your scent has no urine in it, yep. you don't have to worry about it b- being out of season urine, like yep. an estrus in August yep. or something. That's weird. It's all data as far as like what it is. <clears throat> I mean, in just a regular doe scrape, it's hard because when you say regular, people think regular is it's just nothing good. <laughs> but the deer are not in estrus the whole time. Yeah. So preseason scent is early September scent to I say like early October. 
But their glands don't. Their gland scents don't change throughout the year. Um, so they do. When they, they get they, into a cycle, or do so. Uh, so the forehead gland, for instance, uh, each one of those hair follicles comes comes off like a like a. Um, it's all kind of like a like a grease pack, or what you want to call it. They come off of, um, and basically, on a mature box, it gets real dark. It gets a lot, and it gets wet, and and it gets real stinky. I mean, the glands get stinkier and, and more dominant, or definitely a lot you know a lot richer in smell and so forth so and as they do go through yeah the tassel glands they'll darken up uh so is there a time like where you don't you have a scent that's like that you know super dark tarsal um, that's the time so and you don't want to use that in september right so yeah so the rut scent that's what the rut scent's for it's in that magic time so the rut scent for me is in uh the 7th of november um to like the 25th somewhere around there yep and you switch to a different scent Yep. So yep. I, I still, I still, because it, it's so limited what I have as far as those deer around that time that are quality deer. I actually, my videos you watch and see, that's all regular scent. Mm-hmm. It's all a regular scrape, all a regular. Uh, I don't change anything with the um, the licking branch. It's all, it's not, it's that's all seasonal from the beginning to the end. Um, but it's still dated from the deer um, or the scent that I use is from the time that I get it. So that's all dated all the way through, and I don't. So right now. I won't sell any preseason scent, and I won't push preseason scent. Yep, it's still a scent. It'll still probably work, but and people say you have any extra scent. I don't know because yeah. well, I don't have the urine. I don't test my stuff. I can't test it to see you know what the hormone levels are at. Mm-hmm. Um, I just go by um, the timing, the yep. gear that are in there, yep. and what I'm using. When I physically see it, what it is, and know the difference. And you see it. I mean, God, you see a deer from September tassel glands. To right now, it's a big difference. Like usually, it's like a golden color, and that turns like a real black. You know, that turns like the molasses. You know, real, real wet. You know, looking gland. So, so we're getting into late season now, and gun season starts in Massachusetts tomorrow. And I guess when this airs, it'll be already. We'll be a week into it. So, yeah. what do you use for scents in late season? And do you still throw it into scrapes? Are you still throwing them on yep. scrapes? Or are you changing up your strategy at all? So, um, again, like you can be in, you can be in the same town hunting a different piece and what your piece is doing is different from everybody else. Um, I'll still go through and just use my, my regular scent, the scrape licking branch. I'll still use it because right now what I'm seeing is I'm seeing uh, individual bucks traveling by themselves. I've had does come through, four or five, six does come through um, the last few days with not one buck following behind them whatsoever. And I see bucks starting to open up scrapes again, getting into scrapes more right now. Um, and now is, is a time to take advantage of that and start opening those scrapes back up, mm-hmm. setting those back up, get those things smelling good. So when they're coming through and looking, and as the supply of does gets less, you're giving them you know, some more choices to go after and then be in that area. So I'll still keep going through with it with a licking branch, buck and doe, and then uh, the doe and scrape, uh, the doe scrape and the buck scrape. Yep. Because you're gonna have um, some late late does going in heat yep. soon. Yep. You so you'll still have rut. it. Yep. You'll still have it. So um, as I said, I won't sell preseason right now. But I have some customers that just stopped using preseason like last week, mm-hmm. and they still had bucks hammering their licking branch and hammering their scrapes. It's still a natural deer scent. Yeah. So it's still a natural thing for them to do. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you take a hundred percent natural deer scent, putting it in a scrape, they're not gonna ignore it. But if they if you if they're walking uh, behind a doe that's in, in heat or in you know estrus whatever they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna maybe hit it for a little bit or maybe not and just keep on falling on that doe because they know that period's short yeah so but um right now is definitely a time shotgun's a little different like as far as uh them getting pushed around but they still i still have them hitting scrapes um and then when you get into muzzleloader man that's when they you can see them start yarding back up mm-hmm. and that could be a good time to because when one comes through you know they're all going to come through and I see with the cameras change that you get an opportunity to open some scrapes in the snow. I had bucks making scrapes all the way through into January, February, and April, like you said. Mm-hmm. It's just amazing what them still making scrapes that late in the snow, coming by, hitting it up. Yeah. They're still feeling it. Yeah. So take what you can for an opportunity with a deer. Yeah. And know? tell so tell me a little bit more about your two hundred. Um, because I, I that's that's really interesting. And uh what sh- have you uh um have you had success stories with it? Somebody harvesting a huge buck while using it? Is it still so new that you don't know? So it's new and that's a thing. So what's hard with um some of the things two hundred's been out for about a month and um 
I do have, uh, I'll give a shout out to my Western Mass boys, the 413 boys. Um, the new line, they live by it. And um, recently, actually, one of them uh, harvested a, a, a nice buck. I'm not exactly sure if it was on that, but he bought that line twice, which was the Matriarch um, Doe Scrape, the 200, the Interdigital, he said, for whatever, and, and then the Rut. He goes, for some reason, that line, he goes, for the line that I had on his setup, he goes, mm -hmm. that's like phenomenal. The deer are going crazy. Yep. So it, it gears more towards that mature buck that you're hunting. Um, have you put them up on any cameras yet using the 200? Have you? I haven't yet yeah. because my supply is so short with that. Yeah. That and it's it's new. I kind of I kind of left it, but I actually I have the previous years. Mm -hmm. So I tested it last year. I test all my stuff before I put it out. But um, with the 200 and when what's going on with that right now, what I have, I held off because I'd rather have the customer have an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to go out that mature deer. Um, so, but and I've had videos. They'll, they'll they'll do the testing for you. Send videos. I've had videos pictures, come yeah. in, and they yep. you know they don't they don't want to share what they got coming in. But um, I've seen some stuff that's been uh, they're they're definitely the deer seem to be real active and real angry when they come in. Yeah. <laughs> so they're putting some holes in the grounds. Um, and you said matriarch. So is that just the dominant doe? Yeah, it's, it's a sim dominant doe. Big big does. You do mm -hmm. does over one thirty. Mm -hmm. um, just a bigger doe, and, it's, and the same thing when you work with the product that you see how it looks. Um, it's a very selective uh, basis as well as far as you know putting that in the bottle. And there's not. I mean, when I say a limited supply, I'm like sixty to ninety ounces. You know what I have of that stuff. So it's it's very you know time limited what you can use, but. It's amazing when you put it out there and you see the difference how deer react. What do you see like the difference between the hierarchies between a buck, like the buck hierarchy and then the doe hierarchies? Like um, I've seen, I mean, even in Vermont, I told you I saw I think ten deer and nine were does. Five came by um, opening day and uh, there was they just came by one one in a row um, and there was a dominant one following uh, a much smaller doe might have been her her daughter. And um, that when that doe stopped, she she got pissed. She reared up. Yeah, you know, she reared up. She smashed her neck on on uh, uh, the small one, and then punched her right in the ribs with her front hoof. Yep. You know, and made a big sound. And uh, you know, they're feisty. They're 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 super feisty. But what does that mean within the herd when you have the matriarch? Is she is the big buck gonna want to mate the matriarch first? Do they care about that kind of stuff? What does it mean for your hunting? So for me, um, I guess. There's books you can read and there's things you can see. And I'm going to base what I see off, off, my, off my cameras. And um, last year, on a particular scrape, I seen something that, that the books tell you you won't see or what you think you won't see. The video started off like this. It was a spike horn hitting a scrape. Mm -hmm. In the morning, uh, it was like uh, 7.15, legal. Uh, and that was, uh, that, so that was the peak. It was about November 12th, around that time. And then this is another reason why for video. And you see that deer change its stance. Like almost a stance like, like a scared stance. Like looking down, lowering his head. Yeah. And then from the corner of the screen, here you see this buck brisking, coming sideways, sideways into the screen, putting his head down, <laughs> hair up. And that spike horn jumped off. Yep. And so that... Bigger, I guess, more dominant six pointer, which he wasn't really big. He was, you know, but he was bigger than the spike horn. Mm -hmm. Came in, now he's in a scrape. Now, as I'm watching this, I see him looking off in a distance, and then he kind of walks off, and then this busted up eight pointer comes in behind him. And so now I saw a spike horn, a six point, and an eight point mm -hmm. coming from basically from the smallest to the biggest. Between those three bucks, they all hit that scrape within 10 minutes in sight of each other. Within mm -hmm. 20 yards, mm -hmm. when they should be maybe fighting, or you know, dominant buck pushing these out, say, "Hey, get out of here!" After all that happened, and those bigger bucks hit that scrape, that spike horn came back around, hit that scrape again, and I'm like, "So, I see the spike horn hit it, the six point hit it, the eight point hit it, and then the spike horn comes back around and hits it, and then an hour later, <laughs> like 8:15, my shooter comes in." And hits it after all them, mm -hmm. stands around. Actually, he actually that buck is actually on the bottle with his nose down, the shooter, uh, on one of my bottles on the uh, scrape. He comes and hits it, stays there for a few minutes, then he left. 
And then at 120, he came back up that hill again in the afternoon, hit that scrape again. And no, nobody had hit it between no, him. Nothing and no dough. And that's the that's the biggest thing is that there was no does hitting that scrape. That was all on the dough in the bottle mm-hmm. that was having him come back and drive that and and come to that and come to that uh, scent in that scrape. So as far as the indomitable, I think as far as the matriarch and, and the head doe, yeah, I mean, I, I believe, I'm not a biologist about their cycles and what comes in first and, and so forth, but I believe that they are going to be the first does that are bred. And then obviously as the other does come into, you know, uh, you know, basically into, into heat or estrus in late season, I guess any buck is like any free-for-all trying to get what they can <laughs> yeah, get when they yeah. can because it's a short period. Yeah. You know, closing um, time at the bar, but and then I have another uh, recently video I haven't posted up yet. But um, I have some does coming in during the day, and it's, it speaks to that dominancy for the for the does. This doe walks like within five yards of this camera, and her ears are laid back, and she has her head turned. And there's a, there's a doe on the scrape, and there's another doe pushing this doe off. And, and I had a camera on the other side watching it from another angle. And it was just pushing this one doe out, like kind of like muscling them around mm-hmm. and uh, then going to the scrape. But they all seem to eventually hit that scrape, even though they're there. But when it's their time, it's their time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and I'm, hey, I'm more, more for it. More does hit it. <laughs> I'm happy with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, all right. So, so real quick and, uh, and, and we'll wrap this one up. Um, and I'd love to look at all your scents there. Yep. Um, what do you, so what do you use for your cameras? What brand do you use? I've been, uh, I've been finding, I don't know if you ever heard of Ape Man, but I've, I've loved them so far this year. They've got real crisp video. I'm like you, I only do video. Yep. I, I just hate pictures. I felt like I'm missing a lot. Yeah. And, uh, why not, you know, get a bigger, get a bigger memory card, put it in there yeah. and, and you know, let them run. Yeah. Get, get the video, man. It's yeah. great. It's, it's amazing what the things you can miss with pictures sometimes and so forth and what you see with video even hearing the vocals and all that, hearing the grunt and hearing this, I just had a, a buck for the first time yep. go to my uh, mock scrape and snort wheeze on it. Yeah. It was awesome it's to great. see. It's great, yeah. And I've, I've never, I've never personally seen that in the woods, but um, it was pretty cool to see it. And uh, so as far as me, I started off in the Moultries back in the day. And then um, I slowly grew um, as cameras changed. Um, I dipped into the Brownings for a little bit in the stealth cams. Mm-hmm. And uh, yep, I had a couple stealths. So I haven't. So then I've been more. The Browning seemed to be giving me um, more for the buck. So I'm getting like better videos, better mm-hmm. quality. Yeah. Um, and basically getting cameras at under 100 bucks. And um, I I've gr- grown from getting the cheap cameras um, and then getting the poor quality for pitches and so forth. I mean, back then it was like. You know, what was it, like eight, eight megabytes, whatever it was, or eight gigs, whatever it was, as far as the, the uh, pictures there and so forth. Now they're up to 24. Yeah. Any HD video I can get with good crisp sound and studying and learning. So I, I've dipped into the Brownings in, in a bush now, seem to be more, but my Browning is kind of like my go-to. I'll tell you what, if you, um, um, I, it's only, I've only been running them this year because I, I, I did a ton of research just on cameras and what and, <clears throat> and what to get, and I was spending some money. Um, I bought some cell cams and I wanted to get something kind of cheaper, but um, that did good video. These have been making the Ape Man. It's super, super high quality video, um, and the sound is really good. And I think they were like sixty bucks or something on Amazon. That's not bad. So I mean, pick one up. Yeah. Yeah. Try one. Throw them on. Throw it on the HD video setting. Yep. It's um. You can lock the doors and all that as well on um, the cameras. Actually, <clears throat> I don't know. That's one thing I haven't done. Okay. I don't know. I I'm just naive. Um and today actually, it was my first time I've seen a camera of mine um that was messed with. I walked up to my one of my cell cams and I hadn't I hadn't got a picture on it in uh 8 or 9 days and that's yeah. the normally I'm getting pictures every day. Yeah. Um so I was like I got to go check that camera, probably just batteries, brought batteries in there, but it was um off the tree, open. You know, open so all the weather was hitting it, um, and the uh, turned off, and the memory card was taken out of it. And uh, you know, it really wasn't too far from somebody's stand, so probably the person, yeah. you know, whose stand it was. I went in there and put it in there, and in, uh, in the summer I didn't even see the stand hanging. So you know, somebody went in, messed yeah. with it, didn't want it there, took the can- took the uh, card, and yep. um, I'll probably start locking them up. But right now I don't. It's hard, man. Well, <clears throat> right now it's scary going into gun season because you got a lot more people out there. And um, I know a lot of people pull their cameras out. Um, I take the gamble because I want to get as much video as I possibly can during a high pressure time. Yeah. It also shows what anything can happen as far as uh, the scent control and uh, your scent 
in the scrapes and so forth. They might still get some really great video during shotgun. Yep. Uh, these deer can be pushed around, but they're still there. They know where to hide. They know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, but all my sta all my cameras are locked in. They got locks on the doors and so forth. And I guess it keeps the honest person honest, I guess. Yeah. You know, yep. for a little bit. Um, but there's been some cameras stolen, ripped off the trees and so yeah, forth. Such and, a, it's yeah, such a shame. Yeah, even, but... even stands and so forth. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a sad thing and... But unfortunately, it happens. Yeah, I hate it. How we're all hunters. We should all be on the same team. And there's all there just is. There's 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 some bad ones that you know give us a bad name. I'll know? do a note in front of the camera saying, "Hey, this is who I handle. I've been hunting here. Let's touch base. Here's my cell number. Yeah. And if they call, yep. they call. If they don't, they don't. But yep. you try to try to reach out because we're all we're all in the same woods. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. Well. But, Hey, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, man. great conversation. It's yeah. Chad Whitcomb, Backyard Sense. Yep. What's the website? Backyard Sense. So it's Backyard Sense on Facebook. Um, and I'm also on YouTube as well. Um, I have an Instagram. It's Backyard underscore Sense underscore. And um, and the website. The website's BackyardSense.com. Oh, good. You got the good. You got the good. Uh, yeah. Good URL. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So pretty good with that. So you can All go right. on there and order and. Uh, Ian, if you reach reach out to me, any questions you have on, um, if you hit me on Backyard Sense on Facebook and just message me any questions you have, I, I don't mind. I've even had customers like send me where they're hunting and kind of give them some ideas, and I get plenty of spots. <laughs> I don't need any more, so I am uh, uh, willing to help anybody out they want. And uh, any good stories, I love good stories, and any place that need donations and all that, I'm I'm good for that too. I'll give as many donations as I can um, to help anything out, any causes. Awesome. So for sure. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks again, man. It was yeah. great being you. Thank you for having me, man. Yep. Thanks for listening to the Hunt Suburbia podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We're going to release an episode every single Sunday throughout the season, throughout the entire year, and we will possibly be releasing some bonus episodes here and there um, throughout the week as people, you know, come in freshly off a boat kill and tell their stories. We hope that happens throughout the season. Um, there might be weeks where you get two or three bonus episodes. You might not get one for a couple of weeks, but there will be some bonus episodes, but you can count on us every single Sunday to have uh, a new interview on throughout the season. Uh, once again, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Big bucks I've been dreaming often Every night till I'm in a coffin Vermont woods to the burbs of Boston I'm looking for a tree to get lost in Chris Morning's little dust in the snow Quality time, just me and my bow Fall evenings, I know just where to go For some quality times for me and my bow It's just me and my bow